kind of problems we are working on, just to give you a little bit of perspective into why we kind of do this black box monitoring. So who, who here has owned a G fridge light bulb or microwave by show of hands? Who here has owned one of those before? So yeah, I think that's one of the images that people have of GE is that we build these microwaves and fridges and stuff, but we actually build these huge, huge industrial assets. So jet engines, uh, wind turbines, trains, and all of these assets have a ton of data. So basically all this data needs to be ingested into our platform and so that analytics can be done on top of it. So a little bit of fun facts to give you some perspective. G, G power generates roughly 33% of the world's electricity. Every two seconds, an aircraft powered by GE takes off. Uh, there's 35,000 wind turbines globally, and 25% of all the global hydropower is from GE. So just to give you some perspective, um, when a flight lands, there's probably, there's, there are terabytes of data that need to be ingested into our service um, for every flight that lands. So just to put that into perspective, um, why the kind of monitoring we need to do is important. Um, just some of the customers, BP, Ross, and FX Salon, big uh, industrial customers. Um, and basically what we call this is the industrial internet of things. So we produce petabytes of useful and mission critical data, and downtime can have a huge impact. We can lose lives, millions of dollars, so we really need to focus on monitoring and catch issues when they arise so they can fix them um, as soon as they come up. So let's talk a little bit about black box monitoring now and how we can kind of use black box monitoring to ensure that our services are up and to know exactly when they go down so that we can fix them immediately. So who here, by show of hands, has read the Google SRE book or heard of it before? Yeah. It's obviously a very common book out there. Um, for those of you that haven't checked it out, I'd highly recommend it. They also have uh, the Site Reliability Workbook, which is also free until August 23rd for download, so check that out um, before it's offline. Um, and you can also read the Google SRE book online for free. So some of that, we're gonna talk about like a couple pages from that book. So if this kind of stuff interests you, I'd recommend picking up that book and taking a look at it. But basically, uh, what SRE is is fundamentally, it's what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations function. So pretty much handling all of operations through software and basically having a software engineer use their skills to kind of make that job easier. And specifically, what is black box monitoring? So You've probably heard of monitoring where you monitor your CPU, your RAM, your disk usage, you know, all your REST responses, what are already services returning 500, it's that kind of stuff. Um, but what black box monitoring it is, is basically you could have an application or a probe or something running out there that's continuously trying to use your service. So it's kind of simulating an end user. And the questions that it might answer are, is my service up, is my service consumable? And, or is maybe a dependency down, because it's a holistic view of your service. It's not just, is node A up or is node B up? And as some of us have learned, it's node uptime doesn't always mean service uptime. So just because all of your uh, nodes are up and you're, they're up and running, it's, it's not always okay. Um, in, in order for your service to be usable by people or customers or other developers, um, it needs to have actual service uptime monitored by black box monitoring. So yeah, what isn't black box monitoring? Things like CPU, disk, JVM stats, PPROF, logging, all of that is white box monitoring because you know exactly what is going on from the internals of your system. Um, so like also individual component health checks, if you hit like the health check endpoint for your uh, query service or something, you can check that that component's up, but if your entire system's not up, it doesn't really mean much. Um, and basically anything the user uh, cannot find out by, or shouldn't find out, hopefully. Um, and so what are probes? So we're gonna talk about basically small applications, simple applications written in Go that pretty much simulate what your end user for your service would do. And we're talking about REST services, uh, anything like that, uh, ingestion services, query services, any kind of service, and basically how an end user would interact with it. So we're basically gonna try to simulate that and basically uh, page our engineers when something goes wrong with that probe because if, you're, if this application's um, basically simulating an end user and the end user can't use their service, then chances are you're gonna have to page an engineer to fix the problem, so. So let's introduce first a simple REST API architecture. Let's say we have N users all hitting our REST API and we have a, just a simple get users endpoint, right? backed by Postgres. So a very simple uh, REST API with the back end. 
Now, it's not a probe to monitor it. So basically, what you can think of is the probe as an extra user that's constantly using your service every however many seconds makes sense for your business case. And then whenever that goes wrong, you, have, uh, you can either page your engineer directly from the application, or you can have an APM solution on top of it, maybe something like New Relic or AppDynamics that's constantly hitting the probe and checking to see, is everything OK? Is everything OK? Um, and this, you could do this however many seconds makes sense for your service. If your service uh, creates like dedicated clusters, like some of our stuff, uh, you wouldn't want to do this every couple of seconds, because that would be extremely costly to create a dedicated cluster every couple of seconds. But for simple things like just hitting a query endpoint and querying a database, you could obviously do that much more frequently uh, without costing too much to your service. So let's say we're monitoring this simple REST API, and let's say the probe hits the user's endpoint and the query failed, right? So this is a case where we're going to basically catch an error that's happening. So the probe will first, hopefully the probe will catch it first because we're running it so quickly, but then all the other users are going to face that same issue. Potentially Postgres is down, or there's a connectivity issue. Uh, perhaps someone messed up security groups and all of a sudden you can't hit your Postgres, um, which can sometimes happen. Uh, so obviously, you're going to have to page an engineer or someone to wake up uh, and fix this problem. So that would happen through your APM solution, or you can do it directly with the probe uh, for maybe or the pager duty API or whatever kind of paging system you use. So after all that, the engineer wakes up, they fix the problem, and then the engineer goes back to sleep and dreams about auto-healing systems because that would be nice to, instead of having to wake up to solve these silly things. So why exactly would you use Go for these? It's a uh, very simple application, so it makes sense to just have a really simple and concise, use a simple and concise language like Go to do this. Um, it's very, uh, it's really easy to create HTTP endpoints with Go, obviously, and it fits with the cloud and SRE ecosystem. A lot of the tools out there uh, and platforms out there, Kubernetes, Docker, Prometheus, all of these tools, SRE and cloud tools, most of them, a lot of them are written in Go. Um, so it really makes sense for the ecosystem to write these in Go as well. So a little bit about best practices. Um, so basically, check components that will provide the most visibility. Um, you don't want to, uh, so if you have like two, uh, basically two query services that cover most of the components of your system, let's say those two query services hit all of your, your, all of your clusters then, um, or those big endpoints, then query those and check those. Um, you don't want to do individual checks and stuff. They should be lightweight in deployment and operational cost. If you, like I was saying, if you have a service that, for whatever reason, creates a dedicated cluster when you create an instance of it, then uh, you wouldn't want to do that every five seconds because you're going to cost your business way more than it would probably be necessary or affordable. Um, so, and then also probe status should be binary. Your service is either up or down. It's, it's, there shouldn't be anywhere like, in between, like, oh, it's maybe up. That's not usually the case. Um, advanced probe features, so a little bit more advanced. So like uh, service SLA measurements. So let's say you have an ingestion service that I'm going to talk about later. Let's say you are, have a service that reads messages from Kafka and parses them and stuff and writes it to Cassandra, right? So you probably, if you run this kind of service, you might have a, a general SLA on how long that process should take. So probes could be able to monitor basically what the end user uh, SLA is looking like for ingestion. So if you aren't meeting your SLA of like five seconds to ingest the message or whatever, maybe it's a big message, um, then you would basically, uh, you could monitor that in the probe and you could send it to Prometheus or something or a metric store and graph that and see if there's any trends related to that. You could do auto healing systems based on this. So if your probe monitors all of your components and it knows one of them goes, uh, it notices that one of them goes down because of this reason, then you could potentially auto heal based on these. Um, load spikes in behavior, you could also simulate. Um, and then detailed statuses on all of your service components. So let's say, let's say the probe fails and you can't query your, your database, then you, uh, your REST service can't query the database, then you could actually check for that and do a detailed status report and you'd be able to see that your probe is down because of your database being down or something like that. And then when the engineer gets the page or anything like that, then they know right away that, you know, that's what the problem is. Um, next, I'm going to give another example of, at a bigger scale about 
how we're using black box monitoring for one of our services at GE Digital. Um, so we have a monitoring and diag diagnostic service. So basically what this service does is it stores sensor data from, say, a wind turbine or a gas turbine. And it stores all these time series of data. Maybe it's uh, temperature, or the speed in which the tur turbine's uh, spinning, or anything like that. And all of these data points come into our service. And so you, sh you should be able to store data points via, say, a WebSocket or something. And you should be able to query those data points via REST, so HTTP calls. And let's say you also have internal components for parsing, writing, and handling all these different data points and what the business logic is for all of that. So needless to say, there's a lot of moving parts for this. You might have Kafka, Cassandra, and all that. Um, we'll talk about the architecture. So as you can see, this is kind of what the service architecture looks like for one of our services. So we have a cloud gateway written in Go, uh, which sends messages to Apache Kafka. Uh, we subscribe to that topic um, uh, with our pipeline application service that's written in Go. Um, and then we write that to Cassandra with the same microservice. Um, and then we have a query service written in Java for now uh, that um, queries data points, queries for data points for our, from our Cassandra cluster. And that could also be a separate application that the customer has built. So this is, um, by the way, this architecture, I'm going to talk about this more in depth um, in my talk tomorrow at 2 PM in this room. So if this interests you as well, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, that as well. Um, but let's say this monitoring and diagnostics probe ingests uh, data to our probe tag, which is basically uh, a way of identifying a data point, uh, every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, that goes to our cloud gateway. The cloud gateway passes it off to Kafka. Uh, we subscribe to our Kafka topic with the pipeline. And then we write that all to Cassandra. So that happens every 10 seconds, right? So the probe app is constantly simulating a sensor out there in the field that's constantly ingesting, say, temperature data. And then however often you want to uh, configure this, you could check the probe and see, hey, is my ingestion still working? Is my ingestion still working? Over and over, maybe every minute, every 30 seconds. And basically, when you hit that probe endpoint, it'll be an HTTP endpoint. The probe will go and check the query service and check to see, has data been ingested in the past 30 seconds? You might want to do this in the past five seconds, depending on what the SLA is. Um, but basically, it's a way of saying, are all of my components up? Because if you can ingest data through this entire pipeline and query it back, then you know that the service has had to have been up for the past 30 seconds at a high level. Um, and so yeah, you query for it every 30 seconds. And that goes and queries Cassandra. Um, if no data exists, then you know that something, one of these components must be down, right? If you do return data, so uh, if there's at least one data point, then you know that those components should all be up because they're all Kafka's, uh, you're, you're able to publish to Kafka, subscribe to from Kafka, and write to Cassandra, and all of the applications are also up as well. So this is kind of an example of basically a time series service that we have at GE Digital that, and basically how we're monitoring it from a black box perspective. So other probes that we have um, at our, within our company, we usually have one probe per service just to make sure that they're all, they all have uptime. Um, you could also have one probe that monitors all of your services, but for us, it made sense to have separate ones. Um, so we also have like a big data scheduling and execution service. So that's called Predix Insights, our service. And basically, uh, uh, you can submit Airflow DAGs and execute analytics at an interval. Um, so that's what the probe does. It's the probe schedules analytics to be ran every five seconds, and it, we make sure that those analytics run correctly um, and have good output. Um, and if, those, if that all works, then we know that the service must be up. Um, we also have other services that we uh, monitor with, with these, this kind of model. Um, next, we're going to talk about, real quickly, a sample black box monitor, so how you all out there may be able to create your own black box monitor. So it's really pretty simple, like I said. Um, you can basically have an endpoint, and maybe slash hello. Um, actually. This is, like a, this is basically a, a sample service that we want to monitor. We want to make sure that this service is always up, right? So there's not much to this service, obviously. It's just a little hello endpoint that prints hello world. And we want to make sure, for whatever reason, that this service is always up, right? So uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about the probe that will actually monitor that service. So 
we have three functions with our probe interface. It's start, heartbeat, and check. So start basically starts up the probe. It basically uh, starts it up and makes it uh, simulate end user activity. Heartbeat is an optional function that can basically, uh, um, it basically does something every X seconds. So for the monitoring and diagnostics uh, service example, Heartbeat would ingest a data point every 10 seconds. So it's a constant function, or constant uh, thing that's always happening, basically what an end user would do. And then check is the function that get, gets called when you hit the probe and you see, is this service actually up or not? Um, so really simple interface um, to basically get that up and running. So next, we're going to talk about an implementation of that probe that monitors our simple little hello world endpoint that we set up before. So we just have an application probe, and we create a new application probe. There's nothing really unique about that service, so we don't need to fill it in with anything. Next, we're going to start up the probe right here. So just real quickly, the probe is taking off, and then in another, in another Go routine, we're going to start the heartbeat function, which continuously does something. For us, it's going to Actually, for our simple service, it won't need to do anything because the check is just going to check to see if our endpoint is up. So we also set up our application probe status. This is just the simple endpoint that when you hit the probe, it'll check to see if the service you're monitoring is up or not. So yeah, like I said, Heartbeat um, doesn't have anything in it because you don't need to do anything for this uh, example. But for the monitoring and di diagnostic example, it would ingest the data point every 10 seconds, 5 seconds, et cetera. And then check, basically, is the function that will get called when you hit the probe endpoint to check the service uptime. So basically, uh, it goes out to our simple service that we created at localhost slash hello, and it basically checks to see if that service is up or not. Um, obviously, if, the, if it's a 200 response, then you know that, uh, then you know that it, uh, if it's not a 200 response, then you know that something bad is happening with our service, and we, that we need to return a, an, an error. And when check returns an error, it gets bubbled up to the uh, probe response, and then the probe will return a 500. When the probe returns a 500, you'll get paged. So, um, and obviously, if, if nothing goes wrong, then we'll return nil, and we know that the check has worked just fine. Yeah, next, last we're going to talk about takeaways for this. So one of the biggest things that I wanted to cover was node uptime isn't service uptime. So just because all of your nodes are up there doesn't mean your service is actually in a usable state. Um, you can use Go to build box, black box monitors that simulate end users. Uh, we use this concept a lot for all of our production services, and the model has worked really well. And I recommend if you're struggling with any of these kind of issues that it might, be, it might make sense for your teams to start doing. Um, and it catches many production issues early on that white box monitoring might not. So I know that this monitoring and diagnostic probe, for example, I think we wrote it um, about two and a half years ago, and it's probably caught since I've been in, at the company about probably dozens of production issues, um, more so than I would like to admit, obviously, but it's good that it's there and it, it catches so many issues. And it's, while I don't like seeing production issues, it's nice to know that it's getting caught by this first instead of the end user coming to us and saying, hey, why can't I see my data in my database, right? So that's why these probes are so useful is because um, it catches things that white box monitoring would not. So that's kind of it. Um, this is the we're hiring slide. Um, and then questions. So anyone have any questions? <laughs> On. There we go. Uh, do we have any questions for Grant? Oh, right over here. Okay. Excuse me, real quick. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you talked about how this core uh, issues the white box monitoring doesn't catch. Uh, generally, I was thinking like you can have issues with the way you simulate traffic. For example, if you simulate traffic that doesn't use one feature, and that feature breaks, you don't see that in the prober. Uh, and often using real user traffic and the error rates there will actually show you what your users are actually doing, not a simulation. So I was wondering, what errors would this catch that uh, that kind of monitoring wouldn't catch, and why do they matter if no one's using them? Yes, that's a good question. So 
um, it, that is right, the, the response codes, it'll definitely catch those. Um, but for a lot of things we have, we don't have response codes. Like for example, uh, if you are using, um, if for one of our services we have uh, like gRPC and we have WebSockets, so if for whatever reason there's a connectivity issue, um, then that might arise and we might have an issue like that. But for a lot of the cases, yeah, you're right. Um, these status codes, if we do monitor them from a white box perspective and we look at all of our HTTP uh, status codes, we will catch that. But the probe, one thing about it is that it's repeatable. So let's say um, you're doing a new deployment and you just pushed out a new instance of your service. You can immediately check the probe and see, oh, is it, work is it working now? Is it working now? So it's not only nice as like a, a black box monitoring tool, but also just a, a tool that you can have in your toolbox to see, is my service up right now? Um, whereas as opposed to opening up your IDE and, or running a little binary that uses our service quickly. Um, so yeah, good question. That, you know, uh, white box monitoring would definitely catch some of these issues. Um, but yeah, it's just nice having an extra tool that does it as well, maybe at a more frequent interval or anything like that. Hi. <clears throat> so my question is a bit different. Have you tried any other time, se time series databases or you found like Cassandra is the best one? Yeah, we've looked into a bunch. Um, yeah, that's a complicated question or answer. Uh, but we have found, uh, we've done POCs on other databases. I think we've tried out Postgres. Uh, we've also in the works of trying out ScyllaDB as well. It's been pretty good results with that so far. Um, but there isn't really any perfect database yet for storing time series uh, data for at least with the kind of uh, scale that we're working at. Um, so yeah, we're still looking into ways that we can, we've tried a whole bunch of different ones and done POCs, but it really depends on the customer and how much time series data they're ingesting and at what interval they're ingesting it in as well because you have to have a custom data model tuned for the uh, basically end users uh, use case. So if someone's ingesting a data point every one second, it's, you, design the, you design the service very differently from if they're ingesting every millisecond, right? Because you need to bucket your data points differently and all that. So yeah, we've tried a bunch, but um, mainly we've had luck with Cassandra and SillyDB. Okay, we've got another question over here. Hi. Um, you know the, I don't know if you've read the Building Microservices book by Sam Newman, but I think there's an example of this um, where a company ends up you know, trying to test in production systems, orders a bunch of fridges to its office you know, because they fail to correctly uh, distinguish the uh, kind of simulated uh, activity. So I was just wondering what, you have, what steps you have to go through to kind of uh, differentiate the traffic that's or, or, or the events that are generated by the probe. Is that important for you? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so right now it's pretty much identical to what an end user is. So the probe pretty much uses the service the same exact way that an end user would. So we don't, we don't really differentiate from a system perspective, like, oh, a probe tag is coming in, let's add some extra metadata. We could do that, but we just haven't added that yet. Um, we've thought about adding extra metadata onto the probe data points as they're coming in, um, but we've decided against it for now. Um, that may be something we do in the future, but for now, uh, we don't do that yet. Um, so yeah. Okay, do we have any, oh, we do have another question right here for you. Hang on. Remember, just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, how do you monitor your probes? Good question. <laughs> so uh, we use um, New Relic and we, might, we white box monitor our probes by using the New Relic agent and make, we make sure that those nodes are up. We don't have black box monitors for our black box monitors. Um, I guess New Relic kind of checks them constantly, so if they do go down, then that's just something we'll catch. Hi, oh, sorry. What's the uh, next step? So once an error is reported to you, what is the actual, do you look at this error in tools like New Relic and then you take action from there, or how does that happen? How does the developer wake yeah. up to the errors? Right, yeah, so uh, developer first gets the page and then they see that Usually, it's the case, what the case is, is that, uh, we'll go back um, to the architecture diagram. So usually the case is this pipeline used to be written um, in Java. We just rewrote it in Go, which is a talk I'm giving tomorrow at two. Basically, a lot of times that Java pipeline used to go down, um, 
And so people would be ingesting data points and it would get to the cloud gateway. Uh, we would try to, we would send it to Kafka. Kafka was buffering it all just fine, right? But nothing was subscribing to the Kafka topic and writing it to Cassandra. So um, a lot of times that would be the case, would be that the pipeline had an issue. Um, and first, they would basically see in the probe endpoint response that basically uh, less than one data point has returned, or no data points have returned from the probe query. So at that point, you know that something on this spectrum, on this left side, the Cloud Gateway, Kafka, or the pipeline must be down, because we're able to correctly query our query service and see that there aren't, isn't any data. Um, if there was an issue connecting to Cassandra, we would get a 500, we wouldn't, uh, and we would know that right away. But yeah, usually they'll see at a high level that data isn't being ingested, so they'll have to look into that more. Uh, then we have New Relic agents running on, on all of this. Um, so all of these components, all of New Relic agents. So we would be able to see if any uh, HTTP response codes were bad for the query service, or let's say Kafka disk space was full or something, or let's say that there was a fatal er error in the um, null planar exception in the pipeline when we had it written in Java. Then we would catch all of that, um, and then the, the engineer would probably fix, fix it based on that. Um, and then we have some internal tools that we use to make sure that all the probes are up in all the environments and uh, check Zookeeper and stuff and for common issues that are happening, maybe consumer lag with the um, consuming the Kafka topic, something like that. So yeah, we, that's usually what we would do. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Grant. Yep. We appreciate that.